I get to use both my hands today. That means I'm going to talk louder. No. Yeah, usually I have the microphone up here, and uh, so I can't turn my pages. But how are you guys doing this morning? You all get enough turkey and all that good stuff? Oh, I love turkey. I love eating. It's nice having food on the table and uh, having a lot of it. And uh, I was tempted just to drink the gravy, you know, just... Give me that gravy. I love it. I'm a meat and potatoes girl, so no doubt that when I entered the kingdom, I was a meat and potatoes girl there too. I like the meat of the word. I like the truth. I always have because I fell in love with truth from the very beginning. Um, you know, I was over there worshiping, and um, <laughs> I'll try not to get too messed up here. I was over there worshiping, and I thought, It's such a neat thing that God in his word would liken love to a fire, to a vehement flame. It's an all-consuming fire. You know, I think about that, and fire in its essence, and this isn't in my notes, but fire, as long as it is fed, it will devour and consume whatever is in its path. It will stay alive, and it even says in its word, it cannot be quenched, that love cannot be quenched because it is an unquenchable fire. Sounds like God. He is an all-consuming fire, and if you can equate the two, he's an all-consuming love. Really, if you want to get to the bottom line truth, because I'm a bottom line kind of girl, What we're talking about here is love. With all of the toughness and firmness that I sometimes carry or my, you know, my focus, uh, I really fell in love with love from the very beginning. I'm a bride, you know, I'm part of the body of Christ. I'm part of that bridal group. I love the soaking. I love just bathing myself in the understanding of God's love for me. That was never a question to me. I never had to question God about his love for me, ever. Because I felt it. He consumed me. He, he confirmed it. Love has roots. It has action. It does something. It's not just words. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. You know, I love, (laughs) we got a lot of preachers in this house, don't we? But I love, even Lewis, he could have just, he was so traipsing in to what I wanted to talk about. And um, and then uh, Phil getting up here and talking about truth. You know, and I'm not a sidestep kind of girl. I am not the kind that just kind of wants to fluff things. I'm pretty much, because this is the way I like truth. I like people giving it to me straight. So I figure if I like it straight, I'm going to shoot straight too. Now, sometimes there's some maturity involved in that because I've learned that over the years. But when I got born into this kingdom, I had this sensing and and I can only liken it to like a frustration and I sometimes got to a point where that frustration sounded like criticism but it actually was fuel for change see because when you see and read scripture and you're feeling that you're in something that doesn't quite meet that expectation, it causes a frustration. It's like I can't quite get there. Because what did Phil say? This word is truth. See, it is our guiding light. Because what did, what did, uh, what did they say to Jesus? What is truth? Pilate, what is truth? You know what? Because unless you have a gauge of truth, you really don't know what it is. It's a perception of what you believe to be true. And then appears on the scene, truth, in bodily form. I am the truth. 
What I say is truth. How many times did he say this? I tell you the truth. And so where I'm going with this is I want to speak truth today. I want to give you the truth about love, about, you know, getting to use frustration as a fuel and not criticism. Not just finding fault, but trying to bring solutions. See, even in my natural life, um, I was a problem solver, a troubleshooter. It's just my natural tendency. If I see an issue with something, I'm already thinking of ways to counteract, to go, okay, well, we can do it this way. I'm not afraid to change. As a matter of fact, I love that saying, if you always do what you always done, you always get what you always got. So I'm a person that likes, this is why I love ambassadors of change. It's because how many people think there needs to be some change in the body of Christ? Have we gotten all of the promises? No, are we satisfied? No, please don't be, because that's called complacency. When you're satisfied with what you've got, knowing that there's more, that's complacency. And that, to me, causes frustration. Because it's like, come on, let's move. And I'm not talking to this body here necessarily. I'm talking about the body as a whole. I'm hearing stuff, y'all, that is being taught this Sunday morning, and I'm going, good God, Lord. They've got a piece of the truth. I'm not telling them that they're wrong, but there's so much more. There's so much more for us. Oh, I can't hardly wait. There's so much more for us that we can receive revelation and actually start giving it out. And you know where the essence is? Do you know where it all starts? Love. Everything that you do needs to be motivated by love. Giving, love. Healing, love. Deliverance, love. If it's not motivated by love, then it could be worthless in the eyes of God. We were called to be a royal priesthood, kings and priests. That means kings take dominion, don't they? They know how to operate in a kingdom. They understand their authority. And priests understand how to come before God. That is such an amazing title for us. Come before God, know his heart. We're the ones that come near. Remember, the veil's been rent. It's been torn. We have full access, y'all. We don't need to be calling and praying and pleading and we can just come into his presence and talk to him. He said, I've made a way it's through my son, Jesus Christ. If you're in him, you have full access to me too. And kings, there's so much talk about the kingdom and we're, we love the power. Of course, we really got to work in this power thing. But what I'm talking about in essence is the fuel behind that power. So if you want to open up your scripture, if you have your Bibles with you, if you have your apps, I bring my scripture with me everywhere. I got so lost this weekend just reading in the scriptures and finding little nuggets and pathways and oh gosh, I did a lot of research and, and um, you know, I've, I've taught on love in so many different ways because you know, you can approach love in so many different ways, can't you? It grows, it develops, it matures, doesn't it? You know, I see, I, I went right into the deep end. I fell right into the bridal love. So, you know, Jesus was my lover. He was a lover of my soul. And uh, in this day and age, I can say that. Madame Guion wasn't so fortunate. She got thrown in jail for it. She got thrown in house arrest for talking about Jesus being her lover from Song of Solomon. Heavy prices to pay for us to be able to talk the way we do today with the revelation that we have openly. We never want to get to a place where we're not thankful that we take things for granted because look around us, you know, in other places that don't understand God and his ability, what is happening in their countries? They don't know the truth. And so they're scrambling around with nothing really to hold on to. So we're supposed to be that light. We're supposed to bring that kingdom. So I'll try and stay on track here. Uh, we got plenty of time. Go um, turn to James 2.8. James 2.8. I'm just going to read just that one line. And I love what is uh, written here. And it says, if ye fulfill the royal law, 
the royal law, according to the scripture. What is that? Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye will do well. This was called a royal law. That has a lot of connotations right there, doesn't it? I mean, who's going to follow a royal law? You know, it's a royal law. It's meant for royalty thinking. It's meant for royalty lifestyle. It's a whole different way of thinking. So I love how they put that in the context of that scripture, loving your neighbor as yourself. Now we all know the love your neighbor as yourself, don't we? Pretty much. If we know, yeah, the gospel. Um, In Galatians 5.14, for all the law is fulfilled in one word. Get this, okay. All the law is fulfilled in this one word that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. This is Galatians 5.14. See, Jesus came and when he came on the scene, he brought a whole new way of thinking. And it was, it was basically love on the scene. All those laws that we had before, he summed them up so easily. And I'll get to that here in just a moment. But this love is not just an inward sensation and feeling, those little goosebumps when you, you know, see somebody or, you know, or you really say you love them. And it's just that internal, you know, feeling. It's not that. It's bigger than that. Um, We can try and produce it in ourselves, but love is really more than what we see. And this is where I get a frustration. It's like you were saying, the contradiction, or isn't that it? What was the word that you used up here? Distinction. Distinction. What a great word. Distinction. Do you know that we are distinct? We are different than the world. Jesus goes as far as to say we are not even of this world anymore. There's a distinction. We've got all the goods. We are from a different kingdom. When this gets all said and done, you know what the distinction is? Wheat, tares, distinction. Sheep, goat, distinction. He's going to divide it right there. He's going to pull out the distinction. We better be distinct. And that doesn't come from just you know, the world's going, oh, I love you, I love you. They, the world does not understand love. If you're getting your perception of love from the world, it's probably wrong. Because there's only one way to understand love. And here's a really good example of it in 1 John 4, 7. I love John. He was called the beloved. You know, we love, we love Paul because he's kind of like in your face. But imagine the times he was in. He had to be like right down the center, cut down the line. There's, you know, he was a distinction. But John, he talks so much about love. If you look through scripture, there's a lot about love, isn't there? And it says, uh, 1 John 4, 7. It says, beloved, let us love one another. There it is. For love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God. And knoweth God. Well, that says a lot right there, doesn't it? Love. He that loveth not God, or he that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. We know that. God is love. He doesn't do anything outside of who he is. So what does love look like? It looks like God. It looks like all the attributes of the Father. All right? In this was manifest the love of God towards us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world. Now we know this from John, you know, 3.16. That we might live through him. Where are we living? Through Christ. Um, Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to also love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. His love is perfected in us. 
Now, what does perfect love do? It casts out fear. What is that perfect love tied to? The love of God and loving others. Okay, that just sounds like, you know, yeah, we know this. We know this. Distinction. Distinction. There's the distinction. This is what I found when I get around a group of people and they don't understand, they can't tell the Christians apart from the rest of the world. That's a problem. Do you know why it's a problem? Let's go to the word of truth. John 13, 35. John 13, 35. Because you're going to need this. You may already know the scripture, but we got to start applying the scripture. And it says, by this shall all men, all men, know that we are disciples or Christians. We have love for one another. What does love look like? It looks like God. God in us. God through us. It is not a self-motivating. It's not a welling things up. It's not just giving to your brother and feeling like, yeah, I wish I wouldn't have done that. No, it all comes into alignment. It all comes into congruency because it's not filtered by your own will necessarily. It is, it is fueled by God. He's in a consuming fire. He gives us free will to choose love. We have the ability to choose just like he chose us. We have the ability to choose. And once we stepped into that agreement, he gave us the full capacity to love. He gave us the full capacity to change. It is not by your own doing. I cannot do a lot of the things that I do without Holy Spirit in me. I have to have the grace of God to do everything. I am so dependent on him. And do you know why? Because I know that he loves me. Amen. I know that he loves me when I don't feel loved. I don't have to question that. I don't want to stand here and convince you that he loves you because he already said it. It is the word of truth. Amen. But are we making it look like something? Can people tell that we love? And the best way, you can say I love God all I want. I love God. Doesn't it look like something? Say yes. We should see nodding heads. Because didn't it look like something? What is the saying? What is the big scripture that we are all out there preaching the world? Come on, somebody. Good old Baptist background. Come on. We're preaching it. We got a great gospel of salvation. Amen. We do. God so loved the world, he gave. That's why giving is so important. If you're hanging on things like that, you're not walking in what love looks like. I'm not trying to be critical here. I'm just telling you, love looks like something and it's giving. But we're, we're still, I got to have this. I got to do this. I got to, I got to, I, 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 I. And that's okay for a while until you learn. Okay, we're going to move on. Since it's kind of blaringly obvious that we haven't made that distinction very distinct in the world. Hey, I'm talking to myself here too. Before I get up here, <laughs> it's like I tell, I, <laughs> I told Phil, <laughs> he goes, did you get out the sharp stick? Because we had this saying about this sharp stick. Because when I first came into this and having this prophetic anointing and being called as a prophet, we sometimes end up being a little bit in your face. So what I did was I said, I think I use the sharp stick, but I can't really tell if, you know, you're hurting people with it. So I always tried this first, you know. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very careful. But what I'm trying to do is get to a point here. I tried it out here. It wasn't too bad. But I do, I do want to know truth for myself, too. I wouldn't be up here if I didn't. And the revelation that I get and I share, you know, I'm walking through the same walk. You know, we all have to walk this all out. I am responsible. Let me say that again. I am responsible for my relationship with God. Yeah. 
If Lewis decides that he wants to preach on something that I am not really feeling at the moment, it is not his fault that I'm not getting there or getting what I need. Amen. All right? I am responsible for my relationship with God. He said, you have relationship with me. When I stand before the Father, I'm not going to say, that pastor you gave me. (laughs) 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 Do you see what I'm saying here? I mean, we're kind of fun and around with it, but you are responsible for your relationship. It is your personal relationship. This is what Lewis was up here. He he was, you know, he has discussions with his family and he's like giving them truth, saying, you know what? God, God said in his word that he hated Esau. What do you do with that? Especially when we're out there preaching, God so loved the world. Well, God so loved the world. We just happened to be in that world. But he has the ability to hate sin and and activities that we do. So that's a whole nother subject. Let's get on because I'm only on page one and I've got lots of notes. So um, here is the greatest thing here. Mark 12.30. And this is because they're in all the the epistles. I pulled out Mark just because it says exactly what I want to convey here. That's the way it works. So Mark 12.30 And you all know this. I love this. I live for this. It is thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. Now, he gave us two. Remember, there was lots of them, but where are they now? Did he do away with the law? We don't, yes, no. Because where is the law now? It's written on our hearts. It's written on our hearts. So we have the law, but he gave us two that he said, these are the commandments. And the reason why I chose Mark is because Mark puts that extra kick in there. An extra all, all right? And um, then he says, the second is like it, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. I'll read it again. There is none other commandment greater than these. I kept it in red so you knew it wasn't just me. So what is that saying? Two scriptures, two two different kinds of love. Love the Lord your God with all. You can pretty much just say all. Because, you know, way back I looked up the word all and it actually just means all. Like everything, all, all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, that looks like something, doesn't it? So I always said it's getting this one first, which is a great start. How many people in this place love God? Let's see all the hands. We got, yeah, Jerry and Denise over here if you need a little help there. How many here know God loves them? So here we go. We love the Lord, our God, with all our heart, mind, soul, strength, everything. And then we reach out to everyone else, don't we? But guess where we have to start? We're not going to love this way until we love this way. It may look like love to some people, but how long can you sustain that? We are probably the most offended people. We are the the most thin-skinned. I'm telling you from experience, I didn't always stand up here. I was sitting out there with y'all. I'm telling you, I was offended. Then I prayed this prayer. God, don't, don't you love that? You're in the moment. God, I want a, I want an unoffendable heart. Now, I have learned something. I've learned something. Somebody told me, don't pray for peace. (laughs) Don't pray for strength. (laughs) Don't pray for patience. (laughs) Because why is that? Why is that? You know, when I got this iPhone... Because my iPhone, the last time I got it, it had a couple experiences with water. 
And what I found out was iPhones and water do not go well together. It was the saddest thing ever. Because if anybody knows me really well, this is like my friend, one of my friends. And because um, <clears throat> I love technology. I love new stuff technology-wise. It just goes to show where the human mind can go. I mean, this is awesome, but it took a little dive. I wasn't trying to water baptize it. Of course, Siri, no. Um, get, him, get him baptized. I got a baptized Siri. So I decided that the next time I had to get a phone because mine stopped working, that I got this little dealy bob and it's called Life Proof. This is a little plug. And it's Life Proof and it's light and it's thin, so I liked it better than the <coughs> Otter Box. And, um, but you know what I had to do? To make sure that it was waterproof, I had to test it. Okay, had to test it. So that meant I took the phone out first. <laughs> then I closed it all up nice and tight and I stuck it in water and then I set something heavy on it to hold it under water for 30 minutes. Okay, 30 minutes, yeah. And so um, when I took it out and opened it up, it was bone dry. Now, the only way you're gonna find out if there's water leaking in it is if you find out that there's water leaking in it, then you take it back. But what I'm trying to say is I had to test it. So sometimes the things that we go through are tests to say, we're just checking to make sure your heart is unoffendable. Love does not easily get offended. See, it comes with some maturity. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to unfold this because, I mean, we've all read Corinthians. We know, and we'll probably go through that. There's a little snippet in here of that. But don't be afraid to pray those prayers. Just be ready to be tested. I want strength. I want patience. It's a fruit. I do. I want an unoffendable heart. How many people could use it? Now, this isn't your prayer to God. Okay, but... I really literally said, I want an unoffendable heart, so guess what? It's going to get tested. But I can stand here today and I can say, you know what? I can feel when things try to press because I'll tell you what. Offenses build fences. You can tell when somebody's offended. You think you're okay. You think nobody knows. But you know. Because why? We're prophetic people. We sense things. We can pick up on atmospheres. We know when something's being put down. That's why we got Sozo Ministries and stuff. That, come on. Even, even the other, even New Age people understand this. You can pick stuff up. Even science knows this. How many, I mean, has anybody been unoffended at the church? I mean, because almost everybody I've talked to is, I got offended in church, I got offended in church. Well, guess what? So did I. There's life after offense. There really is. It's all just a test. <laughs> you know, it's, it's honestly, it was a great deal when it was just me and Jesus. Wasn't it? Just, you know, because he's got the full package. I like the full enchilada, as you guys know. He's the full package. But then he complicates things and puts people involved in it. And then he says, you've got to love me, but not only that, you've got to love each other. I had a problem with that. People were not nice to me in my past life. They were not nice people. God had a problem with these people. He had a problem with Israel. Got a lot of problems with you people. All right. <laughs> oh, the 23rd. Our area of grievances. Okay, so I'm actually going to turn the page, and this is what I want to do. I'm going to break this down briefly. Oh, Lord, I don't know if I can be brief. I'll try and be as brief as possible. There is a growth process with love. And you know what it is? It's really just a revelation. And you may get it here as a revelation, but you're not going to know it's working until you submerge it underwater and it gets tested. 
So take that with a grain of salt. Now these are, this is what I see as a teacher, as a, as a, as a, um, as a, a person who's kind of gone through some of these experiences myself and as a troubleshooter and I go, okay, well, we got to get down to some, sometimes the simplicity is where you got to start. Break it down to the simplest form, all right? So I'm going to try and, and simplify this. Basically, there are three different main revelations of, of the love, okay? And the first revelation is that we know that God so loved the world that he gave, right? Simplicity. We go out there and preach it all the time. That's our salvation message. Now, that's just gospel of salvation. We're not even getting into the kingdom yet, really, okay? So, um, it seems really main. You know, we're preaching it all over. But the world doesn't really know true love until it account encounters true love. The, the world doesn't really know that God loves them until we bring this word and give them that invitation, so will you accept Jesus? It's an invitation. That's your free will choice. That's why a lot of people, they go, well, yeah, I've already accepted Jesus, but, you know, there's no change in their life. So that's a problem. Again, we're at distinction. We got two groups of people. I love what Lewis just, um, he'd say, yeah, the distinction, saved, unsaved. Pretty easy. You're on one side or the other. Kingdom of darkness, kingdom of light. There's a lot of distinctions. There's no gray. There's no gray. We make it gray in the name of Jesus because we love you. But we'll get to that next. All right. <laughs> test, test, test. Everybody doing all right? Not too bad, huh? Okay. So that's kind of our first revelation is that God loves us. We teach, teach, teach. Almost any place you walk in today is going to be teaching what? God loves you. God loves you. The love of the Father God loves you, no matter what you do. God loves you. Okay, we'll move on. The, the second revelation you're going to get is that invitation. There's a response required. Do you love God? And I just love how wide that one gets. I love how wide and broad we make that one. But... Again, I'm a troubleshooter. I'm kind of the bottom line kind of person. I see things pretty much black and white. And so I want results. I need to see. And what did the scripture say? That they would know. You don't come up and, oh, hi there. I'm a Christian, by the way, in case you didn't know it. They knew by watching them. They knew by what they said. They knew by how they acted towards each other. <clears throat> okay. It's not just saying, I love you, God. Again, what did we talk about? There's got to be some proof. Okay? Because there's all kinds of, of understandings of love. It actually takes God to have the love of God. It actually takes God to have the love of God. We just read that a, a while back. So, the third is to love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, so we got, we got the receiving the love of the Father... We got a reciprocation. Now, this is just a breaking down overview, and then I'm going to get into a little bit deeper. And then the loving your neighbor. And that is the fulfilling of the royal law. Now, you really can't operate very well in this royal law until you get the other two pretty well. Because you're not going to understand love unless you know God's love. And you're not going to be able to reciprocate to others unless you know how to reciprocate to God and understand how that works and then go outward with it, okay? So there's a progression and you can liken this progression, so I'm gonna whittle this back and get out of that spiritual, but I'm gonna apply it to us so that we can really apply it to our daily lives, okay? So in the beginning stages, they're very preliminary, they're very elementary, you just got through saying the elementary principles. He likened that to, drink, to uh, feeding ourselves on the milk of the word. We're returning to the elementary principles. And I'm like, come on, guys. Let's go for it. This is why Lewis is really adamant about self-development, about improving yourself. This isn't just about self-help. It's actually going, what do I need to fulfill what God has called me to do? 
It's my responsibility to read the word. It's my responsibility to pray. It is my responsibility to access or go towards all those things that God has put before me to fulfill what he has called me to do. Because we are predestined for something. It says it in the word of truth. We are predestined. He has an outcome. He already knows what it looks like. We just got to start learning to walk towards it, don't we? Amen. Yeah. I want, I want the full enchilada. I want to be pleasing. I want to be well done. Even though I like mine medium rare, my steak. Medium rare. But he wants us well done. <laughs> See how I can get food in there? Just about anywhere. So, in the beginning stages, we're going to liken this to children, all right? So, when we have children, when the father has a child, the child needs stuff, right? It's not like you're expecting this baby to provide, all right? They're hungry. They need food. They need to be clothed. They need to have everything done for them. They need to have a safe environment. It's all about I. And the Lord comes just like our father, and shows us love by providing, by giving, by giving, by giving, providing food, providing shelter, providing provision, providing safety. Because they need. There was a need in us. He loved us before we even knew him. So I'll back this up. God bless you. God bless you. Matthew 6, 31. Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what, where, wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for the heavenly Father knoweth that you need all these things. Now we know this, don't we? And as children, we know our needs are being met because he's showing us his love. So is that really in question? This is, these are basics. This is what we provide for our family, don't we? We work to provide for our family. We work to keep a safe environment, all right? Remember Israel in the wilderness? Did he not? Don't be thinking that grace wasn't active in the Old Testament. He kept the beasts away from them. They were in the wilderness. Has anybody gone even into, I mean, I was just talking to Sherry the other day, and we were, she's like, I don't, I don't think I'm going to swim in that place. It's full of crocodiles or alligators or whatever they have here in the south. And um, it's the wilderness. It's a place, alligators. So well, <laughs> I guess that would be, if I was a gator fan, I'd get that. But anyway, we'll move along. I'm, look, at, I'm not a, a baseball or a football person, so it goes to show you. Strike that from the record. <laughs> so we'll reel it back in. Wilderness is what I was talking about. Or we're going to get a bunch of upriled Go Gator fans. Come on, girl. Yeah. I don't know what I'm saying, but if you're happy, I'm... <laughs> Okay, we're going to get serious here. <laughs> I love to laugh. It's good for you. So it's all right if you guys let that face go like that. It's, it's perfectly fine. Okay, but uh, he, th the Father consistently shows his love. Don't you know that he loves you just by being here? You got clothes on. You got fed. How many had turkey? It's like, oh, that's so good. I was fed. So the love for me was not in question. But for some, it is. So we have to convey that. But they also need to know that that's a progression. Keep going. Amen. We don't want our children to have to keep changing them and feeding them and when they're in their teens and when they're 30. Right? Right. We talk about this quite a bit, but I'm going to break this down even further. So as a child matures in understanding of that love that they've received, they begin to reciprocate that love in words and action words in action. How many people know that your kids can tell you, I love you, mommy, all they want to, but when it's tested, sometimes a little difficult, okay? One of the things about love is it wants to please. 
it does want to reciprocate. We do want to reciprocate God's love to him, especially when he gave it to us in the first place. That kind of makes it like easy, easier. So as our child grows in our, in our natural, and this is likened to the kingdom, as our child grows, then we start asking a little bit more of them, giving them a little more responsibility, don't we? Okay. We tell them, you know, pick up your toys. We, we instruct them. We, we show them how it's done, don't we? Okay. And they, they do it by obedience, right? Obedience. Obedience. It's not a bad word. Obedience. All right. So, so in case we question obedience, we're going to go turn to John 14. John 14. Love that John. Yeah, I did have to go there. Because it's not taking my word for anything. I stand up here and I give you revelation. Now, this is going on everywhere around us on Sunday mornings. They're teaching, hopefully, from the revelation that they've gotten. And maybe God has not revealed some of the things that they're teaching yet, or they haven't taught yet. And we're going, well, why aren't they going deeper? Why are they? Maybe that's all that they know. I found that if you don't know what you don't know, then you usually don't know. So it yeah. kind of works that way. I didn't know that I didn't know until you know, and then you got to know to really give the truth. So, but the truth is that we got kind of the cheating book here. We won't call it the truth, but we got the truth. So we can line up everything I said. The first thing that I learned about Louis D. Siena when I met the man, because I had a real issue when I was in church. I'm just like, I don't see that in the word. And he's like, don't just take my word for it. Look it up. I have been a steward of the word, and I love getting in God's word. And it's because he demonstrated as a father, a spiritual father, their spiritual fathers, there are, He gave us spiritual fathers. You know, one of the reasons why I started writing some of this too was because of Timothy. God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and sound mind. This is Timothy. Paul's writing him, my beloved. It's his son. It's his spiritual son that he's talking to. He's encouraging him. Because he knows he's going to have to stand before these people that are not really liking him very much, bring in a new word, and he's going, I didn't give you a spirit of fear. So that also reveals something, doesn't it? Fear is a spirit, but so is power, love, and sound mind. Power, love, and sound mind are spirits because who's spirit? God is spirit. Yeah, okay, moving along. So, John 14, uh, 15, we're going to go there because I haven't read it yet. There we go. Um, if ye love me, if you love me, keep my commandments. Then if you pop down a couple more verses to fourteen twenty one, he says that he that hath my commandments and keeps them, he is, he is that love, that he, he is that that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. So, there is a testing. You know, you love Jesus if you keep his commandments. If you keep his... So that's the reciprocation. Clean your room. I don't want to. See, then, then we got the, yeah, we got the, but I love you. I need a, I need a sandwich. <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> Clean your room. All right. So, <laughs> we understand even as natural parents that there is correction. And because you don't know what you don't know, and you're testing the waters, even in the, in the spirit. You test in the waters, do I go here? Do I not go here? Do I do this? Do I do my own thing? Do I do what he wants me to do? It's all that. This, this is a growth process. You're understanding he loves. Now you're learning how to reciprocate by obedience. And if we turn to Hebrews, and yes, Phil, I'm going there too, is uh, Hebrews 12, 6. Because have, have we had to bring correction to our children? And Why? 
because we love them. We love them. It's not a beating. It's a correction. It's saying, no, we need to do it this way. And however that looks for you should be done in a motivation of love. We want them to mature. I want my children, and they are now, heaven has blessed us, because we were, yeah, very unlikely to get here in a good place without Jesus Christ in our life. We were going down to a train wreck. And believe you me, enemy was hot on our trail to make sure that they, he was going to try and take us out any way that he could. So the fact that I'm standing here is God's mercy and grace, probably in that order. Um, <clears throat> So, we'll get to Hebrews. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Now, get the word is son. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? Because we already covered that. But if you are without chastening, of whom of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate... and not sons. In some translations, it says you are a bastard. I'm going to say it because it's scriptural. You're illegitimate. He chastens his sons. Why? Because he loves them. Okay? But if they were without chastening, and of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers, of course, who corrected us, and we, we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? Father of spirits and live. For they indeed for a few days chasten us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, for our profit because he already sees us going in the direction that he's already predestined us to go. He's already seen the outcome. He just is trying to get us in the right direction. All right? So he kind of guides us through that way that we may be partakers of his holiness. Partakers of his holiness. We can be holy. Not only can we be holy, he says, be ye holy. It's not a suggestion. But it is a choice. Just like love is a choice. When we get to that place where we think we cannot be holy like Christ, and we're seeing it written right here in Scripture, go for it. Frustration can be fuel. Just don't be critical. Criticism just criticizes without bringing a solution. needs to be fuel for change. If you're always doing what you've always done and it's not producing what needs to be holy, change. Read some scripture. Find out we are supposed to be holy. He's even given us all the stuff. Now, chastening seems to be joyful for the present, or uh, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present. Depends on who you're talking to. Uh, But painful. (laughs) Nevertheless, want that unoffendable heart. Afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So there's a great outcome for allowing chastening in our life, that it keeps us in the right path, it helps us to stay in righteousness, and it helps us to remain holy, to be holy. Okay? Once a child understands the love given and how to give back to those who... the, the you know, love you, which is easy. It's, it's easier to give back to people who love you, isn't it? It's like, I love you. I love you too. That's great. It's reciprocated. It's, love to, it's easy to love God because you already know he loves you. All right? Yeah, I like that. Okay. And now you're given that opportunity to show love to others. It is no longer all about you. You, are, um, you have learned that what love looks like and know how to display it to your neighbors, as in Scripture, even those who don't love you. And so you get to go on this journey as a child, and then you start maturing, and he shows you how that looks, all right? 
Um, and once you get grown up, then you actually start be given opportunities to do adult things, like here's the keys to the car, go run some errands, and uh, all of that good stuff. So um, it's a maturing process, all right? The love, uh, um, attributes of love are very natural of God. It's the very nature of who he is. He is giving and is a charitable kind of love. Now, if you look up the 1 Corinthians 13, you know, we do know that there's different kinds of love. We talk about it all the time. But agape love is really that term and that word that is used for that God is love. Agape. All right? All righty. Um, if, we, if we look through, and I'm just going to read this for sake of time because, oh my goodness. Um, Jesus said, a new commandment I give you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. But they, this shall all men know that they are my disciples, that they would love one another. Greater love hath no man than this, that the man lay down his life for his friends. Okay, again, we're seeing giving here. The attributes of love, the God's nature kind of love is described in 1 Corinthians. It suffers long and is kind. It does not envy. All right. Love does not parade itself or, pu or is puffed up. We know these things here. It doesn't behave rudely. Does not seek its own. See, it's, it's maturing love. It doesn't seek its own. As children, you're looking for me, 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 me. I, 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 I. I, I need, I need, I need. And then as you grow and you learn how God Use it, he, he displays love to you. Now you can display love to others by the same way. And what does it look like? It is no longer this inward, does God really love me? Does God really love me? I need the love of God. I need the love of God. Well, guess what? You are going to need the love of God if you're not being able to love outward. So it is a valid prayer, but we got to get beyond that. We got to mature. We got to take now responsibility, be able to get the keys to the car. Because what did Jesus do? He gave the keys to the kingdom. He gave keys. Peter was tested. Do you love me? You know that I love you. Agape phileo. Feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. All right? Responsibility. Um, so we went through that. Um, I'm going to get to another point. That royal love. We're going to get. We're going to flick back to James two eight. As a, a church, we need to learn this more consistently. We need to get out of that childhood stage and know that God loves us. Know how that looks when we reciprocate love back to the Father, don't we? Know what that looks like. It's talking about walking in obedience, talking about walking in righteousness, talk, talking about walking in holiness, and then give it out. All right? And those are the basics. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. We're supposed to love our enemies. Enemies. With this kind of love. Tough. Are we walking in it? Maybe not. I'm, 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 I'm saying probably not. A lot of things would change, wouldn't they? So I'm going to get to a real quick point. I've got one more place that I can probably skip to for the sake of time. But James, we're going to read that scripture one more time. I'm going to insert the rest in context. All right? James 2.1 is where we're going to start. My brethren, pay no servile regard to people. Show no prejudice, no partiality. Do not attempt to hold and practice the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, together with snobbery. All right? We don't want clicks. There's a distinction. I'm like, we're all on the same team for all you football fans. You're not fighting against your own people. You're on the same team. A kingdom divided cannot stand. A house divided cannot stand. We're on the same team. Clicks. Got to get rid of those things. For if a person comes into your congregation whose hands are adorned with gold rings and who is wearing splendid apparel and all a poor man in shabby clothes comes in and you pay special attention to the one who wears the splendid clothes and say to him, sit here in this preferable seat, 
while you tell the poor man to stand over there or sit down on the floor by my feet, you are, are you not discriminating among your own and becoming critics and judges without, with wrong motives? Motive, motive, it's a heart condition. Yeah, I know, this is a tough word, especially for us. No partiality in the kingdom of God. All right? Listen, my beloved brethren, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and in their position as believers and to inherit the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? Inherit the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him. But you, in contrast, have insulted, humiliated, dishonored, and shown your contempt for the poor. It is not, is not, is it not the rich who domineer over you? Is it not they who drag you into the law courts? Is it not they who slander and blaspheme that precious name by which you are distinguished, there's that word, and called the name of Christ invoked in baptism? If indeed you really fulfill the royal law, in accordance with the scripture. There it is inserted. If you indeed fulfill the royal law, you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself, and you do well. But if you show servile regard, prejudice, favoritism to people, you commit sin and are rebuked and convicted by the law as violators and offenders. There's no distinction. We're all on the same team. The royal law is to love your neighbor as you, yourself. It's a royal law. It is that maturing. It's that maturity that you can go beyond what you see on the outside and be able to recognize a person just because they're in that same kingdom. Because it's the same kingdom he's promised to you that he's promised to them. All right. This is the same thing that the Pharisees were rebuked for. They wanted the honor of men. All right? He said, I know you because you do not, that ye have not the love of God in you. Because you want the honor of man. His honor didn't come from man. It came from God. Love's behavior is consistent in all crowds. It doesn't just have an attitude at one point and then when you're in another crowd, it changes towards you. And didn't, that's called hypocrisy. hypocrisy. This is what uh, Peter got rebuked for. Acting one way with the, with the Gentiles and another way with Jews. And what did he do? He rebuked him to his face. <gasps> Terrible. Mean. Love. Love. It needed to be corrected because what is it conveying? It's not conveying the love of God. When we're doing these things, when we're not letting these people in, when we're showing partiality, that's not displaying the love of God. It's our responsibility to display. That's why we go through that process. Know the love of God, be able to reciprocate, then push it out. No partiality. Love is that motivation inside of us. It is an external process. And I'm going to wrap it up with this. I'm going to just flick. Because I had pages, pages, y'all. Don't be fooled just by signs and wonders. Okay? Talks about it here in scripture. I know we love the signs and wonders. Absolutely. Absolutely. But remember in Matthew 7, 22, when the people came to him and said, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out devils in your name? Blah, blah, blah. And God said, what did he say? Go from me, you are workers of iniquity. I never knew you. I never knew you. That knowing is that same kind of knowing that, that when a woman knows a man. It's the same one. A knowing. There's intimacy. There's love. There's reciprocation. It's a knowing. All right? The church at Ephesus was doing all the right stuff. They were doing all the right things. They were great. He had kudos for them when, when uh, John was up there and he was writing to the angels of the churches to be sent. And he goes, but guess what he had a problem with? You've forgotten your first love. 
Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Where have you fallen? From grace. See, sometimes we have forgotten where we have fallen from. We have forgotten the grace, like Lewis was just saying. He chose to love you. He selected you. I have plans for you. I have great plans. Don't you have great plans for your kids? You want them to dream big? He wants us to dream big. But you're not going to get there without your first love. Repent and do the first works or return to your first love. Because if you don't do the things that you need to do out of any, if you don't do it out of a motivation of love, and that motivation of love now has been transferred from a me, me, me love to an outward flow, give, give, give love. That is why we talk about the tithe so much because it's an act of obedience. It's an act of showing love that you're not tied to something, that you can give out, you can give and give people in need, that you can accept them and help them, but we got to stop learning that love equals tolerance. Love brings correction. If you want to be like your father, he showed you what it looks like. Correction, speaking the truth in love. Let love be the motivator. If you don't understand the love of God, get it. It's okay. Repent and return. Repent and return. He's there. Get the love of God. Get that revelation. Learn the reciprocation. Start maturing and allowing that. It's never too late. Teach this. Tell people. There's more, there's more, there's more. Until we can start seeing and hearing from people. We know they're Christians. Well, how do you know? Because we've seen the way they love each other. Wouldn't that be a kudo? Instead of the hypocrisy and, the, and all this, the stuff that they talk about us, we've got to start rising to the occasion of holiness and righteousness, displaying that through us. If we have that, God is the center of everything. God is love. If we can turn our hearts to know that revelation, really decide where we are in our walk with God, really learn how, what giving looks like. What, and I'm, I'm, there's all kinds of giving. But, but love isn't like, oh, I feel this way. I love, I love turkey. I love steak. But I don't love steak like I love God. It's different. I know I went there. I don't love my dog like I love God. I know, we're traipsing, we're touching. <laughs> Got out that sharp stick. Do you see? We love lots of things. Love has become such a casual world and, and word in our society, it has. I mean, we've made, it, the world has made it so perverted, just like it perverts all kinds of things that are important to God, like music like hearing his voice, like dreaming, all kinds of great things, like covenant. Covenant equals control. These are lies that have to be revealed. The love motivates our heart to love like God and things will change to the point where people will actually say, these are Christians because of the love that they have for each other. So I just pray this morning. I'm just gonna wrap it up. I had a lot more to share with you, but it was all, you know, pretty much about one subject. <laughs> Are y'all getting it? You know, it really is an example of what family is. He is God our Father. Let me repeat, and for the record, He is our Father. We are sons of a heavenly being, a heavenly spirit. We are His sons and daughters, just like Christ. We have an inheritance. We are here to affect this earth. But let me just tell you what, do it out of love, not for any other reason. And that's where we have a problem with the distinction. We may be caught in one of those me, me, me's, or I just don't know how to return his love because we feel like we're still an orphan or we're abandoned. 
and we're operating out of that wound, we've just got to gather around each other, really find out where you are, get healed up, because we have a world to transform. I know it just sounds like another self-motivation, you know, no. He handed the kingdom over the keys, and he said the gates of hell, are we allowing the gates of hell to prevail? Some of the Christians that I talk to think that we're going to hell in the handbasket. I'm sorry for the words, but guess what? There really is a real hell. Keys to the kingdom have been given to us. Responsibility has been given to us. If we do not start teaching truth and teaching really what is truth, even though it may sound harsh, it is your for your good. We want to see the body mature. We want to see the body excelling. We want to see the body really taking all that God has promised us. I'm not making you this promise. It's in his word. That's what's caused me this frustration. It's like, come on. That's why we've got Metron. That's why we've got 1111. That's why we train and equip here because we want to give you the goods. We want you to know what that looks like. Holy Spirit has been given to you all. Now we got to learn to operate it and it all comes out of the love of God. So just remember this, everything I do has to come out of love, whether it's healing, deliverance, giving. Don't give to get. Don't give to get. It's a principle. It works, but there's a higher way. You give to give without expectation of getting back. Give to those that you know can't give you back. Give and don't let them know you gave. Amen. Don't let one hand know what the other hand's doing. Love. Very simple. Very eternal. A word for every day. I'm hoping that there was an anointing because we've heard this word in so many different ways that it does not bring a change to something that we're doing because it did me. I love God and I want him to know it. And I am learning how to love my neighbor and I am learning how to love my enemies. Hopefully I don't have too many of those right now. (sighs) But I want to get there. I'm honest with myself. I don't just do the love butts. I want to be able to say I love you. The only but that would be in there is that I want to see you go further. I want to see you go further. I want you to get past this, right? Because that's what a father does. That's what a mother does. We want the very best for our children. So operate out of love. I'm going to continue unless we wrap it up. You want to close us out? All right. Let me, let me just pray. Let me pray over them just real quick. Lord, I just thank you for your love. God, I thank you that we have our hearts are open from that very moment that we encountered you, we encountered love. God, this is what it's all about. You are the very essence, the very being. It's who you are. You are love, God. And I thank you, Lord, that as your children, we operate out of knowing what that love looks like, how you want us to, to give love back to you, God, in honor Lord, let us be holy as you are holy, God. We want to be that holiness unto you, God. We want to be that consecrated people. We want to be that distinction in the earth, operating in the manifestations of what God looks like, what love looks like, because they're both the same. If we're giving the world God, we're giving the world love. And it starts right here with our own people, God. We need to be a kingdom that cannot be divided. So Lord, I thank you for love in our hearts. Love through us. Love in the things that we do. Love is a motivation for everything we do. Let it be so, God. So we just thank you for this word this morning, God, and let it come and do the work you had assigned for it to do for everyone here. We thank you for it, Father. Amen and amen.